On the north coast of Peru, in the Lambayeque River Valley, local looters broke into one of the richest royal tombs ever found late on the night of February 16, 1987. Sacks of gold, silver, and copper objects were carried off from the tomb. The looters started to quarrel heatedly about the way to divide these riches, and so one of them went to the police in the nearby village of Sipan to inform on his friends. When Walter Alva, the archaeologist who was head of the local museum, saw what they had found, he immediately recognized its importance and uniqueness. Alva began a salvage archaeology operation, which was formed to dig objects out of the ground that were more spectacular than anyone could have imagined. The excavation at Sipan unearthed the most sumptuous tomb ever found in the Americas. It's been compared to the magnificent finds of King Tutankhamun's tomb in Egypt. Like Tutankhamun, the Lord of Sipan, as he's called, went to his grave with a stunning assortment of gold, silver, copper objects, wood, pottery, and luxurious textiles that had unfortunately turned to dust. Now, all of these opulent grave goods made his powerful role in society clear. The Lord was at the top of the hierarchy, and he was buried with goods that showed in clear and great symbolic detail what he did in life as a warrior and as a priest. They carried his role into death as well. This personage obviously led a complex society which was extraordinarily good at producing objects of luxury that connoted status and power. The Lord of Sipan's tomb was found here at the site of the Huacas of Sipan, where three ancient and eroded mud brick mounds rise from the earth. This is the area of the site of Sipan as seen from above, lush, green agricultural land, irrigated by ancient canals and the river, surrounds the mounds and produces maize, beans, and squash. Otherwise, the long strip of land which borders the north coast of Peru is an arid land with little vegetation. Fortunately, it borders on the Pacific Ocean with its cold Humboldt current, which provides some of the richest fishing resources in the world. Marine creatures like sea lions and octopi, crabs, and numerous species of seabirds figure in the art of this area, along with the land creatures, llamas, deer, owls, snakes, lizards, foxes, and felines. Rivers punctuate the coastal deserts and flow to the coast from the snow-capped peaks and glaciers of the Andes Mountains. The Sipan Mounds are not natural hills, though they echo the peaks of the Andes in the distance. The mounds were built out of adobe by the people who lived here almost two millennia ago. The pyramids, which are actually adobe platform mounds, belong to a culture that is rich and fascinating, but still enigmatic. It may never be entirely understood. That culture is called the moche. No writing exists for the moche, so only the artworks give us insight into this unusual culture. It was an amazing, artistically innovative, warlike, sacrificial, and wealthy civilization. When Walter Alva began to excavate, he hardly expected to find something as rich as this tomb, because almost nothing was known about moche burials. Archaeologists knew that the Moche culture had dominated the North Coast River Valleys of Peru from about 100 AD to 800 AD. The Moche culture was actually named after the Huacas de Moche, two large and now almost destroyed adobe pyramids found in the Moche River Valley. These temples or adobe mounds were enormous. The Huaca del Sol was the largest pre-Columbian structure in South America. The Spanish, upon arriving in Peru, 
treated it as if it were a mine of gold. They extracted objects from the tombs that were hidden within. They even diverted a river to course through it in order to get easier access to the tombs. So not a lot was left for modern archaeologists to discover and study. The Moche culture and art tradition, however, was well known for its spectacular, sculptural, realistic-looking ceramic vessels. Most of these were made in a curious but characteristic stirrup spout shape. The majority of these pots had been found by looters and lacked any context to tell us how they were used or buried. The style of these ceramics was unusual in the arts of the Andes. There were realistic depictions of animals, plants, humans, and even sexual activities. The moche even made what are known as the famous portrait vessels, presumably of rulers or elite people. In fact, Paul Gauguin, the French painter who fled France for Tahiti, had roots in Peru and made a portrait pot based on the moche models he had seen. These moche pots were outliers in terms of the tradition of Andean art, which consists of the ancient art of Peru, Ecuador, and Bolivia, because they were far more naturalistic than almost any other art of the Andes. Most Andean art was far more abstract and oriented to the supernatural world. So it was a surprise when Alva dug down with his crew into what would eventually be named Tomb One, the royal tomb, and found 1,137 of these ceramic pots in a layer above the tomb. This was before he entered the actual funeral chamber. Sitting eternally watchful at his post, the team also found the skeleton of a soldier guardian whose feet had been cut off to prevent his leaving. Inside the main wooden sarcophagus, the excavators found the mummy bundle of a man, an elite individual, probably a ruler, whom they named the Lord of Sipan. His remains were radiocarbon dated to about 290 AD. Several other skeletons, those of humans, a dog, and two llamas, were found buried around him. It seems that some of these people and animals were sacrificed to accompany him in death. The metalwork and other goods buried with this man really stunned the archaeologist. The objects were opulent and incredibly sophisticated. The archaeologist carefully cleaned away the dirt to expose a series of wonders, a golden headdress, necklaces, scepters, pectorals, back flaps of gold and silver, and remains of shells, woven textiles, and feathers. They were technically quite advanced in terms of metalworking techniques and aesthetically superb. Amongst the smallest of the tomb artifacts, to the side of the Lord's head, was a spectacular set of three pairs of ear spools. Large and heavy jewelry plugs worn in a sizable hole in the ears, which distinguished the wearer as a high-ranking person. There were three pairs of ear spools, each with different imagery. The most amazing work of all is this one, an ear spool that depicts the Lord of Sipan himself in miniature. It's a microcosm of the Moche world, and shows us the symbolic place of this ruler within it. Not only is it gorgeous, intricate, and skillfully wrought gold and turquoise object, it's also a window into Moche society, into Moche religion, and into their technical capabilities. This diminutive work of art, besides being a striking portrait of the Lord of Sipan, is really a tour de force of metalworking in miniature. We'll see how the accoutrements that the earring figure wears are almost exact miniature reproductions of the Lord's accoutrements that were actually found in his tomb. We'll see next what makes this such a masterpiece as we examine the object more closely. 
Now, we just left Mesoamerica after looking at a colossal round sculpture of concentric circles with complex imagery, the Aztec calendar stone. Here, interestingly, we will see a miniature version of artistic expression in the very same shape, with a face at its center as well. What we see here is a round disc with a three-dimensional frontal image of the figure of a man. He's dressed for warfare and flanked by two smaller and less detailed subsidiary figures. They're shown in profile. The ear spool is made of hammered sheet gold and inset with pieces of turquoise. The outermost ring of ornament consists of tiny individual hollow round gold beads soldered to a solid gold rim. Within this plain gold ring is another ring composed of small pieces of inlaid turquoise. The color contrast between the turquoise and gold is striking and quite pleasing. These concentric rings frame the central image. In the center of the ear flare is a thumb-sized man dressed as a warrior. He wears a high hat of turquoise, and on top of that rises a crescent-shaped crest of gold. To the side of the crescent, you can see two stepped elements, a motif that is very common in Andean art. These elements are made of sheet gold, and they're separate from the background. The face of the man is wrought three-dimensionally. He has rims repeated around his eyes, which are dark holes, and a fairly prominent nose to which is attached a crescent gold nose piece. This nose ornament is typical of high-status men of the Americas, and this one swings from his septum and can even be detached from his nose. Now, you'll notice that the man is wearing his own ear spools, and these are made of gold and inlaid with turquoise. They are just like the object itself, and show you how the Lord looked when he was wearing them. The ornamentation doesn't stop there. There is a separately wrought necklace of double-strung gold beads composed of owl faces. These owls are important in the symbolic realm of the Andes and are probably associated with night and death. The owl beads are quite small, yet detailed, and the artist made four impossibly small holes through which he threaded extremely thin gold wire. The wires went through each bead in order to create the necklace. The necklace lies on top of a tunic of turquoise. Big necklaces of gold and silver were found in the grave on the actual body of the Lord as well. The Lord here carries two objects in his meticulously modeled hands. He has a war club in his right fist and the club is stuck through a hole and can actually be removed. It mimics the shape of a real Moche War Club perfectly. On his left wrist, he bears a small round gold shield, which can also be detached. Below it are very naturally modeled and muscular legs with the tiny knees indicated by diamond-shaped incised lines. On his belt, we have two sets of bells on crescent-shaped elements. They hang from actual rings here. These are also real ornaments, which have been found as full-sized examples. They're depictions of the decapitator god, a frightening image seen in all sorts of moche art, from murals to ceramics and metalwork. This god was a taker of heads, and the motif of the trophy head is common in most of ancient Andean art, not just the moche. The main figure of the Lord of Sipan has these two profile figures flanking it. These are two smaller men, each of whom wears an elaborate tiered turquoise headdress that is surmounted by a gold crescent, similar to the Lord's. Their bodies are made of inlaid turquoise pieces, and the gold that outlines their ear spools, neck, and shields. This extraordinary miniature of the Lord of Sipan 
complete with removable miniature elements, was attached to the background of gold sheeting. The gold sheeting was attached to a core of wood. The conservators who restored the object marveled at the incredible skill it took to make something like this, with its hundreds of separate tiny parts into a cohesive composition of a miniature human. These Moche metalsmiths had to have amazing skill and experience because this is a pinnacle of Moche and Andean artwork. It shows how sophisticated the metalworking techniques were that they could work in such a miniature method. They needed to master many different techniques. Hammering sheet gold over core, making hollow gold beads, soldering the hollow beads to a rim, inlaying stone pieces into an amazingly small mosaic, creating miniature gold wire, and threading tiny gold beads. They used sheet gold and silver like this to make masks, headdresses, applique ornaments for garments, and for all sorts of ceremonial weapons and jewelry. They also used lost wax casting for these precious metals, and they were able to combine them into different alloys depending upon the colors and qualities that they desired. Copper, for instance, alloyed with gold would make gold more reddish, silver would lighten it. These technical skills combined with their superlative aesthetic values created a true masterpiece of miniature art in the Moche ear spools. Let's look at the other ornaments in the grave of the Lord of Sipan. The other two sets of ear spools were astonishing as well. They were simpler than the figure of the Lord in the ear spool, but still striking. One set consists of an inlaid mosaic of a spoon-billed duck in profile. The turquoise duck is surrounded by thin gold wire and inlaid against a background of lighter greenish stone mosaic. The duck has a hemispherical gold eye and two rings of gold beads to complete a truly charming composition. The duck was probably associated with the fertility of the water and sea from which the moche derived much of their protein. The other ear spool set consists of two deer in profile. They are also composed of turquoise with a gold outline and beading on the rim. These ear spools are remarkable for another innovation. The deer is almost completely cut away from any background. He floats in the air and is only attached at the hooves, the tail, his magnificent gold horns, and his tongue. This is another astonishing technical achievement. These ear spools are both striking visually and technologically bold in their use of cutaways. Using deer in this context was also a message. Deer had great symbolic weight for the moche. Deer were ritually hunted and could serve as sacrifices and seemed to be metaphors for humans. Let's go back to the grave of the Lord of Sipan and see how these ear spools reflect the information that the grave can impart to us. Well, first of all, the two henchmen who flank the Lord in the ear spool are actually buried with him in real life at his sides. They bear military regalia. There are eight human skeletons in all in this grave, consisting of the funerary entourage of the ruler. The Lord, in addition, has an actual large crescent-shaped sheet gold headdress in the grave. It's 62 centimeters wide, or 23 inches, and it's a symbol of his rank. He also wears double-strung bead necklaces. One of the most spectacular consisted of large peanuts of gold on one side of the necklace and silver on the other. This contrast of gold and silver peanuts represented the duality that was so important in Andean culture. The recognition in art of opposing forces or things such as gold and silver, sun and moon, day and night, male and female and life and death. The burial of the Lord of Sipan contained gold nose ornaments, 
and the gold bells with the figure of the decapitator god, this time life-sized. Two crescent-shaped knives, which we call tumi knives, were laid on his chest. One was made of gold, the other of silver. These were religious objects used in sacrificial ceremonies, and they were frequently represented in Andean art. One of the most interesting consequences of the discovery of the Sipan tombs was this. Sacrificial ceremonies and war narratives that were known and represented on moche pottery were believed, until then, to be purely mythical. But now, these supposedly mythical scenes were shown to have real enactors, the actual people who were found in the tombs. The myths had genuine participants in a ceremony, priests, lords, and even the animals. Those roles were real, and they were enacted by high-status people who later went on to their graves with the appropriate costumes and paraphernalia for their role. In fact, a series of fine line drawings on Moche's stirrup spout vessels shows details of what is called the sacrifice ceremony, or sometimes the presentation ceremony. This ceremony is a narrative that is shown on a number of vessels, and it's also known from some now destroyed murals. It was referred to on many pots in different variations, just like a Christmas scene could include only Santa or reindeer or a sleigh, yet you would know what it implied. The theme on Moche Pots consists of a prisoner sacrificing, which is a bit gruesome. Here's the best example. Let's read it. Let's start in the lower register. Here you can see an empty litter decorated with trophy heads on the left. On the right are two distinctively dressed individuals who are cutting the throats of bound prisoners. Blood is spurting out. The war captives' surrendered bundles of weapons are shown to their right. On the top register on the right is a large priest with a headdress having an animal face in its center and long streamers. Moving to the left is a priestess with a jester-like cap and braids ending in snake heads. She carries a goblet. On the left, in front of her, is an owl priest, a man wearing an owl mask. He wears a conical headdress with a crescent and presents a goblet to the main and largest figure at the left, the warrior priest. This warrior priest takes the goblet from the bird priest and will drink the blood from it according to other representations. The warrior priest has rays which emanate from his head and large metal back flaps. He also wears a conical headdress that has a crescent-shaped crest, just like the one found in the tomb of the Lord of Sipan. He has the same sort of nose ornament and wears large ear spools that even show the rings of soldered beads that we see in our real ear spool here from Sipan. There is a spotted dog at his feet. All this information shown on the narrative drawing jibes well with the occupant of tomb one at Sipan. We realize that the man buried here impersonated or was the individual we call the warrior priest in the drawing. He was buried with all the paraphernalia that that role required. Even the spotted dog at his feet has its analog in the real dog skeleton found in the tomb. So this information confirms for us that the occupant of the tomb was the personage who received the sacrificial blood in the goblet and drank it. We know from many other such narrative vases that the Moche engaged in ritual warfare and real warfare as well. Warriors wore elaborate and unique costumes, just like the Maya and Aztec warriors we know from other artworks. The winners in Moche ritual battle stripped the losers of their regalia. Then the losers were bled, sacrificed, and possibly dismembered. Real skeletal remains showing such torture and dismemberment of young warriors has actually been found at Moche sites like the Huaca de la Luna. What's interesting is that the Moche had a practice of 
and reverence for sacrificial bloodletting and decapitation. They engaged in this elaborate choreographed sacrifice ritual that was witnessed by the populace in the plaza. This sort of ritual event bears some resemblance to what we saw in both Maya and Aztec society, though the particulars are different. What we do know is that rituals of sacrifice took place at the huacas or platform temples and plazas and were a grand spectacle watched by the citizens. The actors in these dramas include the people who were unearthed here at Sipa. As in the Maya and Aztec realm, prisoners of war figured importantly in the ritual and were used as sacrifices. The artworks involved in this spectacle, like the mural in the background, the garb and regalia of the enactors, all of it served the message of the ritual and the religion. The message was one of power over life and death and of the magnificence and splendor of the Moche establishment. As the archaeological investigation of more Moche sites continues, more actors in these rituals are being discovered. And we're also learning about more nuances to the rituals and the dress for the central aspect of the religion of the Moche. While we can compare the practices of the Moche to the Aztec and Maya approach to prisoner sacrifice, there is another comparison I can make. When I peer at these elaborate drawings on the so-called fine-line vessels of the moche, like the one we just looked at, I think of the Greek tradition of painted pottery. Here, strangely enough, is a similarity to moche narrative art in content, medium, and approach. Do you remember the death of Sarpedon by Euphronius, the crater that we looked at in an earlier lecture? As we saw then, the Greeks had a penchant for mythic narrative, and they liked to show the heroic death of young warriors. We see many archaic Greek images of young armed warriors. In many cases, these are known from myths and epic poems. Then we see the treatment of such warriors after the battle as well. Interestingly, this treatment in and after death of such warriors was an important subject in the art of the moche as well. For instance, in Greece, the dragging of Hector by Achilles in the Trojan War narrative depicts the humiliation and deplorable treatment of the body of a warrior. Sarpedon, too, is stripped of his armor in the crater scene. Well, that is exactly what is depicted in the moche mythic narrative, the stripping of armor of the defeated warrior. Moche and Maya depictions of defeated warriors show them naked, just like Sarpedon in his death. We do see files of naked prisoners tied to one another by rope at the neck in Moche artwork, including the large painted and relief murals at Moche Huacas. But here's the difference. What we don't see in Moche narratives is any emotion, expressive facial features, or real connection between the characters that people the vase. That is something that we do see in Greek art, at least to a greater extent. But the similar use of the rounded body of the vase to show a story that unfolds in time and space before you is remarkable and not reflected in any other culture in South America. So in this strange and artistically sophisticated culture of the moche, we can find parallels to the Greek mode and indeed even the Mesopotamian unrolling cylinder seal narratives. The use of naturalistic portrait heads is also striking. It's unlike the abstraction that occurs elsewhere in ancient Andean art. In fact, in the next lecture, we will look more closely at the Andean pottery tradition. It is in many ways more like the sculptural tradition of the West, with many different subjects depicted both three-dimensionally and two-dimensionally on the body of a particular few forms of pottery. The tradition is of extremely long standing, thousands of years, and it includes some of the greatest and most compelling masterpieces of Andean art.